Hey, Heather. Brilliant. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we have a wide range of people with us today. Uh, we also have some of our locally elected um, representatives, um, you know, members from other landscape partnerships, uh, members from um, our local council, some of our project partners, you know, people from all over Northern Ireland and um, other parts of Ireland as well. You're all very welcome. Um, my name is Elmarie Swanepoel, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm the Programme Manager for the Loch Gain Landscape Partnership that's based here in the beautiful county of Ferrana in Northern Ireland. Um, our work focuses on the conservation, the protection and celebration of the Loch Gain landscape, including all the special landscape and both heritage features, the habitats, species and people that call this wonderful place home. There is a link um, in the chat box that Heather will put in there um, in a little while to our website. So, so feel free to have a browse around it. Um, and just have a look at some of the fabulous projects that we are involved with um, in this region. So a very warm welcome to everybody. Um, we appreciate that people have taken time out of their busy schedules to join us at two o'clock um, on a Tuesday. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Um, we've had just over 100 people register for today's event. Um, we've had a few cancellations this morning as of course, inevitably, you know, people just need to deal with operational pressures as they arise during the working day. Um, and some people need to leave early. And um, as such, you would see that we are recording this event because we, we want to make sure that this resource is available for those people who cannot join us today. So of course, if you don't want to appear on the recording, then um, feel free to turn your camera off. Um, also, before we start the proceedings this afternoon, um, I'd also just like you to turn off your microphones, to, to, to just turn them to mute, and that just helps us to limit the amount of background noise that will come up in the recording. So, um, this afternoon's presentation um, will focus on um, a presentation from our keynote speaker, which is Mr. Ed McMahon. And afterwards, we will have an open question and answer session. Um, we have invited uh, Sheena Dixon from Tourism Northern Ireland and also Tanya Cathcart from Fermanagh Lakelands Tourism uh, to, to be available also for the question and answer panel later this afternoon. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, guys, just um, put that in the chat box um, or at the end, we will have the facility for you to put your hand up and ask the question if you feel more comfortable that way. So before I hand over to Ed, of course, I just want to make sure that we recognize and thank our main funder, um, both for the Landscape Partnership, which is the National Lottery Heritage Fund, um, as well as also to Tourism Northern Ireland, who has provided funding for this event today. You'll note from our website um, that the work of the Landscape Partnership focuses on creating access to and appreciation of the area's unique built, natural and cultural resources. With tourism numbers in our area increasing, it is important for us to recognize the potential for tourism and recreational development, whilst also emphasizing the need to protect Loch Earn and its immediate interland. Many of the projects that we're involved with have the, has the potential to improve our tourism offering um, in this area. And as such, we're, we're keen to ensure that the tourism potential is both recognized but also promote it in a way to encourage sustainable future development. So with that in mind, um, I'm now pleased to introduce you to Mr. Ed McMahon, a world-renowned speaker, lecturer and tourism thought leader. Ed's message today is going to focus um, on the power of uniqueness and the role that tourism can play in economic development and economic revitalization. Um, Ed currently holds, holds the Charles E. Fraser Chair on Sustainable Development at the Urban Land Institute in Washington, D.C. And he's also the author or co-author of 15 books, over 600 articles, and he's also delivered some truly inspiring talks. So we are very privileged um, to have Ed with us today. And Ed, we would like to just thank you for the time that you've taken out to come and talk to us. Um, so without further ado, then, I'm going to hand you over to Mr. Ed McMahon. Um, Heather, can you just make sure that we've got Ed's presentation up there? Is it, can you see it? 
Um, it hasn't come up yet. If you, just, if you want to share your screen now, yeah, that would be. Okay, hold on. Let's see. What's the problem here? Okay. It's it's not it's not appearing. Not at the moment. No. Not yet. Okay, it did work earlier, everybody. We tested it twice. <laughs> see here. It's not coming up just yet, Ed. Here we go. You see it now? Um, it says that you started screen sharing. Yeah, perfect. It's just not quite come nope. up. Yep. Yet. Came we up now. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Omarie. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, it's an honor to be with you here today. Uh, I am coming to you to this afternoon from sunny Washington, D.C. It's actually a beautiful day here in the uh, in the high 70s, so it's uh, probably a little different than it is there. I, I just want to start off and tell you a little story about how I got interested in what I'm going to talk about today. Um, way back during the Vietnam War, I was a young second lieutenant in the United States Army. I had been to field artillery school and to jungle warfare training, and I had orders to a small fire base in the central highlands of Vietnam. About two weeks before I'm supposed to leave, however, I get a call from the Pentagon and I have a colonel who's in the personnel division and he says to me, Lieutenant McMahon, do you have any interest in being reassigned to Europe? And I was like, okay, that sounds great. I would love to go to Europe. And I was one of the very lucky few. I got sent to Heidelberg, West Germany, which in those days was the headquarters for the U.S. military in Europe and one of the most beautiful small cities on the planet Earth. Uh, I then spent the next two and a half years of my life traveling all over Europe in a helicopter, and that experience completely changed my life, but I didn't realize how much until I flew home to Birmingham, Alabama, where I grew up, and I got out of the airplane and I drove home, and for the first time ever, I saw the American landscape with a completely different set of eyes, because, ladies and gentlemen, to travel is to learn. And that's what we try to do at the Urban Land Institute where I work is to learn about what's working, what's not working, what could work better in land use and development and tourism planning and a lot of other things. So uh, one of the things that I learned is that, you know, uh, I got to travel to Ireland a number of times. I've been to Northern Ireland as well as Southern Ireland. I actually have walked across Ireland from coast to coast. And I would say that, you know, you would all probably agree that Northern Ireland is a pretty special place. Uh, it's a place with great people and great history and great resources. And I think that Liam Neeson sums it up pretty well when he says that it's one of the world's best kept secrets, both in the character of its people and in its of its scenery. But the truth is, the sad truth is, uh, there is no place, no place left in the world today that's going to stay special by accident. And you say, well, why is that? And the reason, of course, is because the world is changing faster than it ever has before. And you say, well, what's changing? And the answer to that is everything is changing. The economy, technology, demographics, consumer attitudes, healthcare, travel and tourism, energy, the weather is changing in case no one has noticed that. But you know, the truth is there are only two kinds of change in the world we live in today. There is planned change and there is unplanned change. I mean, you can grow by choice or you can grow by chance. You can grow by default or you can grow by design. You can accept whatever comes down the highway or you can choose the future that you want. Of course, the biggest unplanned change in recent years has been the global pandemic, which has turned upside down many of our communities and our economies around the world. But you know, the real question for you in Northern Ireland, wherever you're from, is not whether you will change. The real question is how. As Abraham Lincoln used to say, the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. And I know, having grown up in a, in a part of the country that, you know, people say, I don't like change. I, I understand that people don't like change. But as I said before, there's only two kinds of change, planned change or unplanned change. You can either have plain change done to you or created by you. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about the impact of tourism uh, on economies and communities around the world. Tourism today is the world's third largest industry. 
Uh, in America, for example, we spend almost $800 billion a year on travel and recreation away from home. Uh, in Ireland, uh, you're getting, you know, before the pandemic, excuse me, let me back up there. Uh, over 11 million visitors uh, in, in 2010, spending billions of pounds, et cetera, et cetera. International visitors took an estimated 3 million overnight trips to Northern Ireland in 2019, and tourism is one of the three largest industries in every single U.S. state. But tourism really is a double-edged sword. Uh, I use this slide to illustrate this, that the idea that tourism can has, has many benefits and it can uh, help communities in a lot of different ways, but it also can have a downside unless it is carefully managed and thought through. So what are some of the benefits of tourism? Well, obviously new jobs and expanded tax base, enhanced infrastructure, improved facilities, a market for local products, arts, crafts, et cetera. On the other hand, tourism can come with a downside and that's things like traffic congestion or crowds and noise, increased crime, haphazard development, cost of living increases, uh, uh, degraded resources, et cetera. Uh, the head of the American Planning Association's Tourism Planning Division likes to say that the impacts of tourism on a community can ben be beneficial if planned and managed or extremely damaging if left without controls. So how do you ruin a destination? Well, go to Venice, Italy, or go to Dubrovnik, and you'll see that overcrowding, too much tourism is really harming these destinations. Insensitive development, sign clutter, traffic congestion. If a destination is too crowded, too congested, or too much just like every place else, then why go? So this workshop today is really focused on answering this question. How do you keep from harming the goose that lays the golden egg? And you live in a very beautiful part of the world. And one of the questions is, how do you preserve that beauty and that landscape and that heritage to make it appealing to tourists from other parts of both Ireland and around the world? So I'm going to talk about nine things today, what I call keys to sustainable tourism. And I'm going to go through each one of these in turn. And by the way, we will make a PDF of this presentation available to you after the talk. Uh, as well as uh, there'll be a recording, obviously, that you can go back to it if I go too fast on some things. Also want to apologize if you don't, if my accent is wrong or my pronunciations are off, but growing up in Alabama, I still have a few uh, little quirks in my accent here. So let's first talk about the difference between mass market tourism and sustainable tourism. Mass market tourism is really all about quality, excuse me, quantity. It's all about heads in beds. Uh, it's also uh, about environments that are artificial, homogenized, generic, formulaic. Sustainable tourism, on the other hand, is about authenticity. It's about quality, specialized, unique, homegrown kind of things. And it starts with recognizing that there are certain kinds of things that typically typify mass market tourism. I mean, think about the size of cruise ships today. You'll have a small Caribbean uh, town of, you know, five or 6,000 people, and there will be four 5,000 person cruise ships will show up there at one time. That'll put 20,000 people into a small, tiny Caribbean town all at one time. Or what about mega hotels or theme parks or chain stores, that sort of thing? You know, what difference does it make if you spend a dollar in a chain store versus a dollar in a local store? Well, if you spend a, spend a dollar in a chain store, like in the US in Walmart, most of that money will end up in Bentonville, Arkansas, which is the Walmart headquarters. You spend a dollar in a, in a local store, it will recirculate through your community three times more than a dollar spent in a chain store. So sustainable tourism is really about, you know, distinctive places, historic buildings, unspoiled scenery, locally owned businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, mass market tourism, as I said before, is all about bigger is better, more is better. It's high volume, high impact, but low yield. Sustainable tourism, on the other hand, is about low volume, low impact, high yield. All tourists are not created equal. So let me give you an example. When I was in college, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida was the spring break capital of the United States, and they wanted to be the spring break capital of the United States. They thought it was a great idea to, you know, encourage a couple of million college kids to come down there every March uh, or early April. But what they didn't count on is that the kids were all going to sleep six to eight to, room, to a room. The only thing they'd spend money on was beer. They were going to tear the entire city up. 
they'd have to hire all kinds of extra police and cleanup crews. And pretty soon they earned a reputation as an out of control, drunken college kid town and nobody else wanted to come. So what did Fort Lauderdale do? Well, they changed their mind about spring break. They said, we don't want to be the spring break capital of America. Today it's Cancun, Mexico and Panama City, Florida are the spring break capitals. Today, Fort Lauderdale has fewer tourists, but they sleep two to a room. They eat in nice restaurants. They spend more money. They shop in, you know, nice stores and art galleries. They don't have to require, they don't have to hire extra police or, and cleanup crews, et cetera. So even though they have fewer tourists, they have a greater return on investment. And those are the kind of tourists that you should be encouraging to your community as well. Let me give you another example. I already mentioned cruise ships and sort of over tourism. Uh, research uh, shows that if you are a, uh, if you fly to a small Caribbean island and stay in a small nature-based lodge or ecotourist destination, you would spend 18 times more per day than a cruise ship passenger would spend. If most of the money spent by cruise ship passengers goes back to the, the, the international airlines, hotels, cruise ship companies, et cetera, while on the other hand, local hotels hire and purchase locally, and they put a much higher percentage uh, of their earnings back into the local economy. So think about how the difference between mass market and tourism, it's about quantity versus quality. Uh, so the sec second thing I wanna talk about is this idea that tourism is about more than marketing. It also involves making destinations more appealing. And this of course means identifying and preserving or enhancing its natural and cultural and assets. In other words, preserving and enhancing its landscape and its heritage. And don't get me wrong, tourism marketing is extremely important. Uh, you know, it promotes a destination, it positions, excuse me, promotes visitation, it positions a destination, it identifies and segments potential visitors, it provides information in, in, about a place. However, the best marketing in the world today is word of mouth. And we get word of mouth when the reality of the place meets or exceeds the mental image that you have been sold through marketing and promotion. And this is even more important today because of social media, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera, where everyone is talking about where they're going, what they're doing, what they're seeing, et cetera. So this is the typical kind of image you would see in a, you know, a beach resorts brochure. You know, it's the, 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 the couple walking hand in hand down an empty beach. But suppose you get there, this is the reality of the place. By the way, that's Benidorm, Spain, for those of you who might not re uh, recognize that. But the same, you know, could be true of, you know, you're promoting heritage. This is a uh, historic building in Montgomery, Alabama, which is kind of people's mental image of the Deep South. Uh, but suppose when you get there, the reality of the place is this, where you look out across from the Great Column House and you will find a billboard or a, a, an empty parking lot, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the, the, the brochure is handsome, the city is not. Now, I'll never forget my first visit to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, which is the home of the largest Amish community in the United States. And they do world-class marketing. And what they're marketing is, you know, bucolic countryside with quaint Amish folk and horse and buggies. But when you get there, the reality of the place looks like this. Um, it, you know, and this is, uh, excuse me, this is um, uh, route, U.S. Route 30, which runs through the heart of the so-called Amish country. I'll never forget when I'm driving down the road with my children and my daughter is sitting in the back seat of the car and she says to me, gee, daddy, I didn't know the Amish lived in castles. And so what's happened to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, which has now become basically a busy suburb of Philadelphia, is that people come once and they don't go back. And of course, the reason is because the reality of the place is at odds with the mental image that they've been sold through marketing and promotion. So marketing is important, but you can do all the marketing in the world. In fact, they've seen a slow but steady decline in visitation because of not protecting the landscape they were trying to get people to come to see. The next thing I want to touch on is this idea of focusing on authenticity. You know, 
the link between quality of place and the ability to attract tourists or retain residents and talents is, is increasingly clear. And a strong sense of place, I believe, has to be rooted in authenticity. Northern Ireland has really world-class natural landscape, great small towns, beautiful architecture, et cetera. But, you know, but it's a mistake. So many communities try to copy other places. That my recommendation is to be yourself. And the truth is, in a world where capital is footloose and people can live or work almost anywhere today or visit any place, the more you do to enhance the uniqueness of your communities, the more people want to visit. On the other hand, the more any community in Northern Ireland came to look and feel just like every place else in the world, the reason there is to visit. Because that's what tourism is. It's about visiting places that are different, unusual, and unique. If every place was just like every place else, there'd simply be no reason to go any place. And so we have this term we use in the real estate world. It's called the placemaking dividend. And it basically means that people stay longer, spend more money, and come back more often to places that attract their affection, to places that attract their affection. So what we're really trying to talk about today is ways that tourism can be used to benefit a community while minimizing the burdens on local communities. Certainly one of your most outstanding landscapes outstanding assets is your landscape and your scenery, which is, as I said before, world-class, but not as well known as many other parts of Europe, for example, or even in the Irish Republic. Another thing that attracts people is food. You know, the differences of food in different places it might be barbecue in North Carolina, it might be you know, Mexican food in New Mexico, but it might be Irish uh, food in Ireland, et cetera, et cetera. Music can set you apart as well. These are all part of what we talk about when we're talking about authenticity. So food, music, landscape, arts and crafts. Um, Ireland has a great tradition of arts and crafts. I have a friend who used to be the chief industrial recruiter for Western North Carolina, and her job was to try to get some plant factory or distribution center to move to small towns in North Carolina. And she wasn't having a lot of success with that until one day she woke up and realized that there was a huge silent industry in Western North Carolina. She called it handmade crafts and it was a hundred million dollar industry. And she created a new organization called Handmade in America. And they started creating craft trails, started teaching marketing in all of the junior colleges, community colleges, et cetera, et cetera. So arts and crafts can be a big part of authenticity. Vernacular architecture, you know, shouldn't buildings in one part of the world be different from buildings in another part of the world? Shouldn't buildings in the Southwest be different from buildings in the Northwest or the Northeast or, you know, in Ireland, for example, shouldn't they be different from other places in the world? What about unique cultures and events? In, in Maryland, where I, uh, I live right across the DC line in, in Maryland, we actually provide a subsidy to the skipjack fleet, which is a commercial oyster fishing fleet, the last, you know, commercial sailing fleet in the world, uh, you know, we try to preserve these, these traditions, et cetera. You have the Mummers uh, Festival is a great example of local cultures and events. What about lot wildlife? Uh, people will travel long distances to, to, to see unique wildlife. Uh, unique ways of life. Uh, Elkhart County, Indiana is the second largest Amish population in the United States, and they've done a very good job of preserving their rural landscape, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, so when you visit a place, do you want to see the real place, the, the real Ireland? Do you want, or in this case, the real South? Or would you rather see like the haunted South, the unreal South? This is a picture I took in, in uh, outside of Smoky Mountains National Park. We had three headed monsters at the haunted golf and video arcade. Uh, this is the uh, official travel guide for the state of Oregon. Notice their slogan. They say, Oregon things look different here. Can you imagine a, a travel brochure that says something like, Northern Ireland, things look the same here? Well, of course not, because why would anybody want to go if it was just the same? So preserving your uniqueness is a critical factor in expanding your tourism industry, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing I want to say, I want to recognize is that sustainable tourism always begins by inventorying your assets. Every community has assets. Obviously, some have more than others. But I want to make the point, I'll make it again later on in a lot of different ways, that the story of your city, town, or region is an asset. 
the story of your city or town as an asset. Might, we're talking about that it couldn't be, a, be an asset both psychologically and economically. So this is this, where I grew up. This is Birmingham, Alabama. It was, and when I was growing up there, it was the Johannesburg of America. It was known as a dirty industrial steel town, but it's also known where, as the birthplace of the US civil rights movement. Uh, we had a mayor when I was growing up named Bull Connor. And he's the guy that turned all the dogs loose on the civil rights demonstrators. And it's where Martin Luther King wrote his letter from the Birmingham city jail, et cetera. Well, that's a painful story, but it's a true story. And it's a story worth telling. And that story can enhance a place as a destination. And that's exactly what's happened in Birmingham, which has really undergone a tr total transformation from when I grew up there. So the steel industry is gone today, but we didn't tear down all the steel mills. We've preserved the oldest one. It's called the Sloss Furnace, and it's now a state park and national historic landmark. You can, it's hard to see the sign here in the second. So this is Kelly Ingraham Park which was the site of the civil rights demonstrations of Birmingham. The church at the end of the sidewalk is the 16th Street Baptist Church, which was the site of a terrible act of domestic terrorism in 1963 uh, when four little girls were blown up by the Ku Klux Klan. But right next to that is, this, is the Civil Rights Museum, and it's now part of a civil rights district. And people come from all over the world to visit this place and to learn about the history of civil rights uh, in America. Let me give you another example. So this is, you know, sometimes tourism assets are just hidden in plain sight. And I was uh, doing some work in Northeastern Pennsylvania, North Central Pennsylvania. Uh, and one of the, they have a, about 30 something state parks there. And this is one of them called Cherry Springs State Park. And one day this uh, guy shows up at the park manager's uh, office and he says, knocks on the door and said, could, could he come in? And the park manager said, sure. And he says, uh, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm so and so, and I'm with the International Dark Sky Association. And he says, Well, what's that? He said, Well, we're astronomers. And he said, Do you realize that your park is in the darkest place in the eastern United States? And the park ranger had never actually realized that. And they go from that conversation to becoming the number one dark skies park in the United States. They now have relationships with five universities. They now have astronomy festivals. They now have bed and breakfasts that are catering to astronomers. So here was their asset was the dark sky, but no one had realized how important that could be to their economic well-being as well. It's just a simple example of turning lemons into lemonade. The next thing I wanna talk about is this idea of preserving historic buildings, neighborhoods, and landscapes. Uh, historic buildings are oftentimes the community's greatest asset, and the value of historic buildings, you know, is psychological, it's economic, it's environmental. You know, historic buildings tell us who we are and where we came from. You know, a city without a, without a past is like a man without a memory. And so historic buildings, they do indeed shape our memories and our identities, and we can leverage those buildings to create an economic future as well. But let me show you what happens if you don't value these things. This is the birthplace of Thomas Wolfe, who was a great American writer. He's the guy who penned the immortal line, you can't go home again. Well, sadly, Tom Wolfe, he can't go home again because here's the site of his house in this parking lot in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, so, you know, preserving historic buildings is not just about psychology, it's about economics. So I chair the Main Street America, which is the network of almost 2,000 communities working on small town revitalization and asset-based, historic preservation-based community revitalization. This is a small town in Wisconsin. It was one of the first communities we worked in. This used to be their fire station. A guy bought this building and he turned it into a pizza parlor. But like so many small towns in America, this was a town going downhill until we brought in the Main Street program and we started doing things like talking about the importance of restoring historic buildings to their character. And so he did that uh, and it restored that building and it created, told a story about the history of the building. But guess what else happened? Well, the sales of pizza almost doubled and it sustained that over a multi-year period. So preservation can be very, very good for business. Uh, let me show you four of the the most valuable tourist attractions in the United States. What about the French Quarter in New Orleans? Well, 
I, I was invited to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina to help put together the redevelopment plan for the city. And so all of the consultants that, they, that the state of Louisiana brought down, of course, wanted to know, well, what's the biggest industry in Louisiana? Is it the sugar industry, the seafood industry, the oil industry? They said, no, no, no. The biggest industry in the entire state of Louisiana is the tourism industry. That's number one. And what is the, the biggest engine of that industry? Well, it's the French Quarter. But ironically, for about 40 years, the state of Louisiana wanted to put a freeway through the French Quarter. And it, today, they realize that the French Quarter and the historic neighborhoods that surround it are more important and more valuable and generate more income than anything else in the state of Louisiana. Let me give you another example. What's the number one tourist attraction in the state of Texas? Well, it's the San Antonio Riverwalk. And this small river, which is now the basis of, of a $3 billion a year annual tourism industry, uh, the city at one time wanted to put that river underground into a culvert. They thought, simply thought of it as an eyesore and a flood hazard. Today, it's the most visited place in all of Texas. Let's fly across the country to Seattle, Washington and visit the Pike Place Farmer's Market. Uh, that's the number one destination in all of Washington state. But yet 25 years ago, people on the city council wanted to tear it down. Why? They said, well, we need more downtown parking. And people said, well, like parking for what? You can have all the parking in the world if there's nothing to do, no one's ever gonna wanna go there. So there's so many examples of why preservation pays off for tourism. And, you know, sometimes, you know, tourism assets, preservation assets aren't even all that obvious. This uh, built photo on the left uh, is a huge elephant. You can see the house next to it, give you an idea of the scale. It was built by a developer in 1881 uh, called Lucy the Elephant, uh, and it's now a National Historic Landmark. Or in Devonish Island, for example, you've got a great historic attraction as well. What we found is that heritage tourists stay longer, visit more places, and spend more money per day than other tourists. And uh, of course, we'll leave you with these uh, statistics, et cetera. So the average length of stay for, stay for someone interested in culture and heritage is about 4.7 days. The average length of stay for a visitor who wants to go to, for example, an amusement park is only 3.3 days. Uh, the average expenditure for uh, cultural and heritage visitors is almost $1,000 per trip. Uh, other visitors, about $600 a trip. Author Fromer, who's one of America's most uh, leading tourism writers, he sums it up pretty well when he says, among cities and towns with no particular recreational appeal, those that preserve their past continue to enjoy tourism. Those that haven't receive almost no tourism at all. Tourists simply won't go to a city or town that has lost its soul. So saving the soul of the place is pretty important. But you know, one of the things that we oftentimes do is we save a landmark, but forget the landscape surrounding it. And we've done that in America in many, many cases. So we've done a pretty good job of saving you know, uh, landmarks from the American Civil War, for example, but then we lose the landscape around the landmark that you know, gives it the larger sense of meaning let me give you a, a classic example from here at home. And I apologize, I don't have more Irish examples, but of course, uh, most of my work is being done here in North America. So George Washington's home, Mount Vernon, is, uh, gets about 1 million visitors uh, every year. He has another house, however, which is his boyhood house, which is uh, in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and they only get about $20,000 a year. And, you know, even though the one in Freshburg has a has an advantage because there's a 7-Eleven right across, so you can get a Slurpee uh, right there. But, you know, what's the difference between these two places? Why does this get a million tourists a year and this only gets 20,000 tourists a year? Well, the reason, of course, is because the Mount Vernon has saved not just the house, but the setting around the house. They saved the house, the grounds, the outbuildings, the slave cabins, the, the mill, uh, the distillery, et cetera. And then how do you get to, to Mount Vernon? Well, you drive down the George Washington Memorial Parkway, one of the most beautiful roads in America. And then when you get to Mount Vernon and you look across the Potomac River, what will you see? Well, you will see the exact same thing that George Washington used to see because the first scenic easement in America protects all the land on the other side of the river. So yes, there's development over there, but you just can't see it because it's below the tree line. It's behind the hills, et cetera, et cetera. 
So, you know, once again, if you can't differentiate your community, you'll have no competitive advantage. And in fact, this publication, The Economics of Unique, was just done by the World Bank, and it goes on to talk about what I've just mentioned in a, for about 250 pages in different ways. In other words, sameness is a minus, not a plus in today's world. So just to give you an example of this, so here's four cities. And if we were doing interaction right now, I'd ask you, where, where are these four cities? And it's obvious that they're Paris, Amsterdam, Washington, D.C., and Edinburgh, Scotland. But let me ask you this, where are these four cities? Can anybody tell me where these cities are? Well, I'll tell you where they are. They're, you know, in uh, China, Russia, South America, and Australia. Uh, but, you know, welcome to London. Uh, you know, what we're doing is we're, we're homogenizing our communities all over the world. You know, we've gone from an architecture of place, architecture of time. So now every city pretty much looks just like every other city, but the cities that preserve their uniqueness are the ones that people most want to visit. All right, next thing, uh, ensuring that tourism support facilities fit in. Tourism, ladies and gentlemen, is the sum total of the travel experience. It's not just what happens uh, at the museum or on the, uh, on the hike in the, uh, the beautiful landscape, et cetera. It's everything that happens from the time you get home to the time you get back. It's about the hotels you sleep in and the restaurants you eat in and the shops you shop in, et cetera. So I wanna make a strong pitch here that hotels, you know, bed and breakfasts, lodging facilities should fit in with a community, both environmentally and architecturally. And they can, this is a, I pulled this uh, ad out of a airline magazine some time ago and it says a chain of hotels should reflect a city and not each other. But this is what you typically get with chain hotels. This is a Hampton Inn chain in the, in the United States. But let me show you another Hampton Inn. This is one in Lexington, Virginia, a beautiful town in the Shenandoah Valley. That's an old manor house and that's where you check in and that's where you have your breakfast and the hotel is uh, in a very sympathetic new building behind the historic manor house. Uh, here's one in Sedona, Arizona, and here's one in Jackson, Wyoming, and here's one in Huntsville, Alabama, and here's one in Mexico City. The same could be said for, for Marriott. It's basically, instead of having a, you know, a cookie cutter off the shelf buildings, they, have, they can have site specific plans like this Marriott in New Orleans, or this Marriott in Bristol, England, or this one in Germany, or this one in Dublin, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing is that people really, as it goes back to this authenticity idea, is like play historic buildings. There's a, uh, the, this Hilton Hotel, which used to be grain elevators in Akron, Ohio, uh, was the centerpiece of the Quaker Oats redevelopment project, which began the revitalization of Akron. So adaptive reuse, taking old buildings that had another purpose, like this train station in St. Louis, or this old mill in Salisbury, or this castle in Spain, and turning them into lodging facilities is one of the great ways to differentiate yourself. Uh, here's a, a small example. This is in a little town called Roscoe Village, Ohio, and all the buildings in the upper left were built in the 1850s. The, the hotel you see in the bottom right was built in the 1990s. It fits right in. The hotel becomes part of the attraction. It doesn't detract from it. Another example, this is a small historic town, Leesburg, Virginia, about an hour outside of Washington. And their Holiday Inn, same idea, a manor, old manor house uh, with the hotel built behind it, et cetera. Uh, in Astoria, Oregon, famous for their canneries, well, they built a new hotel that looks like an old cannery, and I could go on and on. But, you know, one of the things I also want to rec recognize is that, you know, travel is changing. For millennials, young people, interesting has become more important than comfortable, and authenticity is more important than predictable. You know, Holiday Inn used to have this slogan of, you know, the best thing about Holiday Inn was no surprises. But today they say the slogan is the worst thing about Holiday Inn is no surprises. Why do you think Airbnb has choose, uh, proven to be so popular? People like staying in unique places. So here's one of the things I want to leave you with is that new construction should respect existing community character. But this is what's happening all over the world. We have these global international corporations like McDonald's and they take an off the shelf building and they plop it anywhere in the world. 
Well, one of the things we've learned here at home is that when a chain store developer, whether it's a McDonald's or anybody else comes to town, they always have three designs, A, B, or C, ranging from anywhere in the world to unique, sensitive to local character, something that fits in. And what gets built depends on you and how much pushback you give them on what matters. So here's a McDonald's in Bray, Ireland, outside of Dublin. And here's a McDonald's in Chinatown in New York. And here's another McDonald's in Long Island. In fact, uh, people go to this McDonald's to pose for their bridal photographs. Not something you'd say every day about a McDonald's in America. Or how about this one in Hamlin, Germany, or this one in Freeport, Maine? By the way, this is the first one in America that went into a restored historic building. And uh, free, they, what had happened there was McDonald's had bought this old house and they were going to plan to tear it down and put up their typical suburban style McDonald's and Freeport said no. Um, and they said, well, what do you want us to do? They said, well, we want you to restore the house and you can put an addition off the back. You know, uh, McDonald's sued the town and twice and they lost both times. But guess what? Three years later, a picture of this McDonald's appeared in their annual corporate report as an example of their good community stewardship. Um, so I could just go on and on. You, the point is you don't have to accept off the shelf cookie cutter architecture and new development. Uh, and McDonald's and all these other chains will change their typical design if you ask them to change them. You're not gonna get anything unless you ask for it. So that's a McDonald's in Annapolis, Maryland, not far from where I live. That's one in St. Louis, Missouri. And of course, check out the McDonald's sign in Salisbury, Austria on a beautiful historic street. So you say, well, how do you do this? Well, there's lots of ways. I'm not gonna, I could do a whole workshop on all these different techniques. But one of the things I wanna say is just, you could set up tomorrow. You say, we don't have the laws in order to do this. You just set up a program, I would call it voluntary compliance, mandatory review. You simply say, we're going to talk about what new commercial buildings look like before they get built. And if you couple that with design guidelines showing people what, not, what you want, it's not enough to say what you're against, show people what you're for, what you want. And in my experience, in almost 80% of the time, you will always get a better building if you simply talk about it before it's being built. So here's an example. This is a Super 8 motel in Anywhere USA. And here's another Super 8 motel in a little town called Goshen, Indiana. That's in the Elkhart County where the Amish are that I told you about. They simply had voluntary design guidelines that said, we want new hotels, motels, and tourism support facilities to look like they belong in a rural environment. And so they sat down with Super 8 before they built their motel and said, we want you to do something different. And they did. All right. Next thing, interpretation and education. People want information about the things that they are seeing. So that's one of the reasons why education and, and interpretation is so important. Can it improve stewardship? It can educate visitor, visitors. It can minimize negative uh, impacts. It can uh, tell visitors why something is important, whether about the culture, the environment, the heritage of a place. Can it even communicate expected codes of conduct? You know, so if you go into Yellowstone National Park today, before you go in, you'll get a bright day glow uh, uh, brochure about the fact that the wildlife, like the buffalo, they're actually wild. Do not approach them. And every year we still have people who will go and try to pose their children on the shoulders of a buffalo, and then they'll get gored or something like that. But it's a way to try to help educate visitors, give them information, et cetera. One of my favorite ways to tell the story of your community. And if I, I know that if you were, if I were to come to some small town in Northern Ireland, people would drive me around the town and tell me the story. But I want to recommend that you make the story of your community manifest in the landscape. You, you make the story tell itself in a way. And one of the ways to do that is to use public art. Public art can attract visitors, publicity and attention. And it can even add fun and interest to the streetscape, but it also can tell a story. So. One of the things you might think about doing is you might celebrate famous people. We, uh, Babe Ruth's statue is in Baltimore where he grew up, and Eleanor Roosevelt's statue is in uh, Hyde Park, New York, where the Roosevelt home was, and Buddy Holly, the famous rock musician, uh, his statue is in Lubbock, Texas, where he grew up. Well, you also could celebrate famous events like the lunch counter sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina, or the Great Depression, the bread lines in Washington, D.C., 
But you say, well, okay, we don't have any famous people, but every place has got ordinary people. So you might celebrate them as well. It might be watermen or ranchers or coal miners or fishermen or commuters or whoever it might be. Uh, you also uh, could use murals. Uh, the one on the left is the Cattle Drive mural in Fort Worth, Texas, and the Dairy Girls mural in, in Dairy, Northern Ireland. Or this one on the lower left is the family album of my little town of Tacoma Park, Maryland. Every one of those pictures tells a story about the history of our town. You say, well, how do you pay for these things? Well, you see this mural on the bottom right? It's uh, called the, there, it's, it commemorates a, a diner, a famous diner in a little town called Nashua, New Hampshire, and it burned down in a fire. And so the people in the town wanted to bring that uh, the mural back, I mean, the diner back to life. So they painted this mural. And how'd they pay for it? Well, all the people you see in the mural, they're actually real people who live in Nashua today. They all paid to have their pictures included in the mural. Uh, where there's a will, there is a way. And money almost always will follow good ideas. Where's the largest baseball bat in America? Well, it's in Louisville, Kentucky, because that's where they actually make the baseball bats uh, that are used in the major leagues in baseball in America. Or how about in Orlando, Florida? If you want to see what old Orlando looks like, you can look at a 23 foot high uh, postcards uh, that show you what old Orlando looks like. Or if you were to go to Spokane, Washington, where they manufacture radio flyer wagons, we now have a piece of playground equipment, a piece of public art, and something that tells you about the history of the community. Uh, did you know that in Hershey, Pennsylvania, all the street lights are Hershey Kisses? You know, so just think about this. Public art doesn't always have to tell a story. Sometimes it can just add fun and interest and whimsy and excitement to the streetscape. Uh, the girl there is obviously painted on. The tree is real. Uh, so if you have a blank wall in a community, what could you do with it? Well, in Columbia, South Carolina, they painted this Trump Loy Fool the Eye mural. They finally had to put a sign up there because people were trying to drive into this thing. Uh, but, you know, it's a way to create some excitement on the streetscape. Or how about this one? Uh, where What do you do with, with boarded up windows uh, in town? Well, in a number of communities, they've done inventories of boarded up windows and then put murals uh, into all of the windows like this one out in Indiana. So what about this whole idea that I start off with protecting community character? And I've made this point in several different ways that, you know, successful communities really are distinctive communities. And this is true not just in tourism, but you know we live in a world now where people, particularly in post the post COVID world, where people can pick up and move almost anywhere. Uh, and so the unique characteristics of a place may be the only truly defensible source of competitive advantage for cities and towns. Lock Earn is something no one else has, for example. Mark Twain put it this way. He said, we take stock of a city like we take stock of a man the clothes or appearance are the externals by which we judge. Let's talk about a community's front door, its gateway. And just like with meeting a person, a good first impression is important and a bad first impression is hard to change. Do you think you would rather visit the town of Franklin, Tennessee or the town of Midfield, Alabama? Which one looks more like a community with a sense of pride and a sense of place? Which one looks more like a community that you would rather invest time or money in? If you don't remember anything else I say this afternoon, remember this. The image of a community is fundamentally important to its economic vitality and quality of life. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that every single day in the world, people make decisions about where to live, where to vacation, where to retire, where to invest, based on what our communities look like, what they look like. Now, I know some of you will be saying, well, isn't beauty in the eye of the beholder? Well, I'll tell you what we've learned at the Urban Land Institute is we've learned that you can simply put a dollar value on a view. Scenic landscapes have economic value, not just because you and I think they're nice, but because other people are willing to pay to see the view and to experience the unique character of a place. Housing, hotels, offices with scenic views always command premium prices. The better the view, the higher the price. Simple example of this. If you were to go to a rent a hotel room with a view of the ocean, as opposed to a hotel room in the same hotel without a view of the ocean, you will pay more for the room with the view of the ocean. Well, what are you paying for? What you're paying for is the view, ladies and gentlemen, the view. 
So do you think a view like this has more value or do you think a view like that has more value? You know, nothing except love is as appealing as a view, said historian Alistair Cook, and you have some of the world's greatest views right in your own backyard. So obviously the laws uh, uh, are very different in the United States than they are in Ireland, but these are some of the tools that we use uh, to protect scenic landscapes. They don't always involve creating a park and they don't always involve buying the land. We use things like scenic easements and greenways and farm protection laws and urban growth boundaries and transfer development rights and scenic byway designations and tree and landscape ordinances and sign controls and deed restrictions and so on and on and on. And here are four examples of places outside of national parks in America that are protected examples. The Big Sur Coast in California, uh, Canopy Roads in Tallahassee, Florida, a green belt around Boulder, Colorado, or a view of the Palisades in Hudson River, uh, Hudson River, New York, and New York, New Jersey. And there, none of these were bought up. These are mostly privately owned lands, but protect me. So the question I ask you today is, do you want the character of your county to shape new development? Or do you want new development to shape the character of the county? How you answer that question will determine what kind of community you are 20 years from now. Let's put it another way. Should new commercial buildings reflect your community, your region, your country? Or should new commercial buildings look like any place in the world? And once again, how you answer that question is critical. Uh, two last final things, uh, enhancing the journey and linking sites. You know, the Western author, uh, West uh, Louis de Moore, he used to say that the trail is the thing, not the end of the trail. Travel too fast, you'll miss all you're traveling for. You know, we've got a lot of great destinations left in the world, but we have very few great journeys left. You know, Charles Corral, a U.S. Uh, newscaster for many years, had this story, had this show, TV show called On the Road. And he used to say, thanks to the interstate highway system, it's now possible to travel from coast to coast without seeing anything, uh, which is why getting off the main drag, the main highway, and getting onto the back roads is so important. Uh, Lady Bird Johnson used to say, we all know the difference between a road that beckons and a road that depresses, and isn't it true? We see relatively little of any place in the world on foot, so preserving the view from the road is critical to imparting a sense of place and creating economic value. Protecting scenic roads and byways is a key component of, of successful tourism anywhere in the world. What we've found is that scenic byways increase traffic from three to 20% and it increases expenditures as well. You know, it can be a foundation, certainly for touring in Ireland, driving is, is, is a key part of that. Uh, so, you know, what is the most visited unit of the national park system in the United States? Well, it's the Blue Ridge Parkway and it gets about 18 million visitors a year. It's a road that goes from nowhere to nowhere, but literally 18 million people will drive it because it's the road less traveled and it has huge economic impact in the communities all along the way. The other thing I want to think about is that how, how do you link sites together? Quick story about this. I was uh, traveling to a meeting in Memphis, Tennessee some years ago, and I was flying from Washington, and most of the people on the plane were speaking French. And I thought, well, that's kind of unusual. Where are all these French people doing going to Memphis? So we got into the airport and I was picking up my bag uh, and the, the French guy standing next to me, I said, what are you guys doing here? And he goes, oh, we come to drive the Blues Highway, the Blues Highway, Memphis to New Orleans, okay? There's almost no one in France, I guarantee you, that is talking about going on vacation to uh, Cleveland, Mississippi, but they're gonna go through Cleveland, Mississippi because it's on the Blues Highway where all these small towns in the Mississippi River Delta, this poorest part of America, have created this route that links all of the sites that, that tell the story of the birth of rock music and blues in the United States. And they all have small performance venues and people are making international journeys to visit these places because they all link the bigger attractions of Memphis and New Orleans. Uh, another uh, community it's called, that did this is in Virginia. They created the, a, essentially a country music trail. They call it the Virginia Heritage Music Trail. And it links performance venues and 
country and bluegrass music sites uh, all along south, through Southwest Virginia? Or how about the civil rights trail? In other words, you know, link yourself together with other places so that, you know, they, they might only spend you know, a certain amount of small amount of time at Inniskillen, but they'll go to Inniskillen uh, along with other places as well. So here's some ideas for creating trail driving trails, you know, scenic trails, culinary trails, recreational trails, architectural trails, cultural trails, wildlife trails, water trails, literary trails. Mississippi's got a great literary heritage trail which links the sites, the birthplace of all the famous authors from Mississippi. Uh, and, you know, it, it's quite popular, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, second to the last thing is get tourists out of their cars. It's kind of hard to spend money when you're in a car. So when people go on vacation, they like to walk. And walking is the most popular form of outdoor recreation in the world today. Bicycling is also growing incredibly fast. In the U.S., it's growing fast because we've got literally tens of thousands of miles of abandoned railroad lines, which are all now being turned into hiker-biker trails all over the United States. Uh, we even did a survey uh, asking people what they most wanted in new house developments. And we found that walking trails and bike trail paths were number one. What was last on the list? Golf courses. Uh, and so interesting, golf courses cost millions of dollars to build, millions of dollars to retain. Building a walking trail costs only a fraction of that. We also find that there are numerous studies that show that walkable places create real estate values and we have a supply demand imbalance. We have more demand for walkable places than we have a supply of them. In the US, we found that for every one point increase in what we call walk score equates to a $700 to $3,000 increase in home value. We also found that uh, stores in commercial, in walkable neighborhoods do much better than stores in drive only neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera. Bicycling, I can't emphasize enough how important bicycling can be. You know, uh, a study was done by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection that found that the longer a trail was, the farther people would travel to visit it, the longer they would stay and the more money they would spend. Uh, these are just a list of some bicycle friendly destinations uh, in North America. Uh, this is Hilton Head Island. I'm named for Charles Frazier, who was the, uh, my chair is, is Charles Frazier. He was the developer of Hilton Head Island, North Carolina, and uh, South Carolina, excuse me. Uh, and one of the things he did is he preserved all of the green space and he set, set out a bike trail system so he could get around without using a car. Uh, same thing exists in, in other parts of the country as well. Bicycle infrastructure, ladies and gentlemen, is relatively inexpensive and it gives you a big return on your investment. Portland, Oregon has developed a 300 mile network of bike trails, bike lanes, and bike boulevards, about the same cost as one mile of urban freeway. And the Outer Banks of North Carolina spent about six and a half million dollars on, on a bike trail along the beach. They estimate they received a nine to one annual return. Last thing I wanna talk about, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers is recognize limits and manage tourism. I mean, always ask this question, how many tourists are too many tourists? How much congestion is too much congestion? How many recreational vehicles are too many recreational vehicles? How many tour buses are too many tour buses? How many fishermen are too many fishermen? By the way, this is what we call combat fishing. This is up in Alaska uh, where we just kind of overfish things. Over tourism can breed resentment. We're learning that in city after city all over the world, whether it's Dubrovnik, uh, Croatia, or Venice, or you know, closer to home, et cetera, et cetera. And tourism can you know, make people want to not have tourism. So always evaluate how many are too many. And communities that don't manage tourism, they run the risk, as I've said before, of harming the place, breeding backlash and resentment. And the goal of my talk today is to try to give you ideas on how to maximize the benefits of tourism while minimizing the burdens. I'll, I'll leave you with this thought. Tourism can help the economy preserve the environment only when local governments control development. Otherwise, poorly planned development can harm the area leading to environmental damage, low paying service jobs and chains of hotels and fast food joints wiping out local businesses. Uh, so I'll open it up for questions and answers here. Uh, I'll come back and tell you a little story later about the picture that you see on the uh, slide here as well. So I'll turn it back to you, Al Marie, uh, and I want to say thank you to everybody this morning for for listening and staying online.
Thank you so much, Ed. Um, honestly, what an incredible whistle-stop tour. You know, for so many of the important elements of tourism development, you know, and that powerful, powerful message around um, ensuring that we protect and preserve the the uniqueness, you know, of the area that we're in, absolutely. Um, so we will now have an opportunity for some questions for Ed. And like I've said at the beginning, we also have um, Sheena Dixon from Tourism Northern Ireland and also Tanya Cathcart from Fermanagh Lake and Tourism. Um, they have also agreed to answer any, you know, specific questions you might have. So um, feel free now to put in any questions that you have in the, in the chat box. Or if you want, you can put your hand up and then we will try and get you get you into the conversation. Um, so I'm just having a quick look here, Ed, at the questions. There's a question here from Chris, from Chris that says, do, do people in places not also need to continue to live and make new stories for themselves? Well, say, say, that say, say that again. Say uh, that again. I read that from, from, from the beginning. It says, I'm very much in agreement with the reasoning behind preserving your local landscape story, etc. Indeed, I'm sure that the, that the key is to be able to identify the existing assets of your destination. However, whilst old stories are great and indeed should be preserved, be they actual oral stories, of which there are plenty, the story of place by the preservation of historical structures, the conservation of uh, the natural environment, etc. What about the creation of new stories? Do people and places not also need to continue to live and make new stories for themselves? What are your thoughts on this? And is there anything to be said about developing new and unique stories? Would development in new directions not also be authentic if they are specific to their location, time and people? Well, I, I think that's a, a, an excellent point. And I would think that, you know, developing new stories as well as, you know, preserving old stories is, is incredibly important. And, and the truth is, as I said at the beginning, the world is constantly changing. And so communities are changing. And so their stories are changing. And so, it, you know, this is a process that's really never completed. And, you know, one of the things that I just think the, the key here is to make, as I said before, the story of the place, the story that you want people to know, somehow make it manifest in the landscape, manifest in the community. Uh, just to give you another example of this, some years ago, I was... Uh, driving through the, it's called the bluegrass country of uh, Kentucky. And I was driving into, um, into Lexington, Kentucky through this beautiful horse country. And there's uh, all these, you know, uh, horse farms with, you know, white fences and, you know, beautiful vistas over things. And then I get into downtown Lexington, I'm walking around, they have these huge outdoor photo panels on the side of a building and one of them shows this kind of cluttered, ugly commercial strip with, you know, the signs and the billboards and the, and the fast food joints, et cetera. And the other one shows the picture of this landscape that I just drove through. And there's a caption underneath and it says, basically, uh, the outskirts of, of Lexington, Kentucky would look like the picture on the left if the city council of Lexington had not taken action in 1973 to create an urban growth boundary to preserve all of the land outside of the city. And so what's interesting about that is, as I said at the very beginning, there's almost nothing going on in the, in the landscape in the world today accidentally. And so if a landscape is beautiful and preserved, somebody has taken some action, some public policy action to actually preserve the landscape. You know, it's interesting. I, one of my favorite states in America is Vermont. And Vermont is a beautiful, you know, kind of reminds me of Ireland, the same kind of beautiful bucolic countryside and rolling hills and greenery everywhere in mountains. But Vermont is also distinctive because it's one of five U.S. states that does not allow any outdoor advertising, none at all, okay? And when people go there, they'll come back and they'll say to me, guy, I really love Vermont. And I say, well, what'd you love about it? Well, it was just so beautiful. Well, why was it beautiful? I don't know, it was just so different. And I go, well, did you notice there was no outdoor advertising? Oh, that's it. And 
people, nobody ever like mentioned that. So now actually Vermont on their tourism brochure has a sign that has a, has a cover that shows there are, no there are no billboards in Vermont, here's why. And then they show pictures of this beautiful landscape. So stories are always need to be updated. Stories need to be told and to explain to people why your place is a special place. I think that's a, a key idea. So thank you for that. Very good, thank you, Ed. Um, Emmanuel here said, hello, Ed, fantastic talk. I was wondering what strategies you'd suggest to reduce tourism flow when too much? Well, I just say there's, a, a, you know, what we're doing, uh, a lot of places could absorb more tourists. They just can't absorb the tourist cars. So uh, I've worked with the US National Park Service for many years. And one of the first places I worked was Zion National Park, which is in Southern Utah. And it's this incredible um, box canyon. It's about uh, 15 miles long, I guess, with huge rock walls on each side. And it used to be, they would have traffic jams going in and out of the park. And then there would be fist fights for people trying to find places to park in the parking lots. And so there was all this demand for more parking. Uh, the parks decides to propose to create a, a, a shuttle bus system that starts in this little town of Springdale, Utah, which is the out right outside of the park. And all of the local merchants were first opposed to this thinking, well, uh, we don't want to stop people in, in their cars. But what happens is today you can't go into the in the uh, Zion National Park anymore in a car. You have to take the shuttle bus. But it turns out the shuttle bus stops at all the hotels and motels in Springdale and people have to walk to the shuttle stops so they spend more in the town and then there's no more no, no more traffic jams in the park there's no more fist fighting uh, there's there's no more demand for more parking lots the visitor experience has improved the 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 expenditures in the town have improved etc so it's it's just, that's just one example of tourism management Dubrovnik is another place that has they now have, they've now set a limit of 5,200 people a day that can come with inside the gates of the wall of the walled city. It had gotten so out of control that, it, you know, there's a, there's an old expression, Yogi Berry used to say, it's so crowded, nobody goes there anymore. Uh, well, that's the way a lot of places have become. Uh, Venice is now saying no, no to large cruise ships. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of creating what I would say, I would suggest to you that there's a concept called carrying capacity, deciding ahead of time how many people or vehicles or whatever you can accommodate before you start to deteriorate the actual resource that you want. There's a, a town in Southern Florida called Sanibel, Florida, a beautiful uh, coastal island. And they were used to be part of uh, Fort Murphy, uh, Fort Myer, Florida, the county there. Uh, but if you go down to a lot of South Florida, it's just 40 story condos all up and down the beach, et cetera, et cetera. But to go to Sandybell, there's no building taller than three stories. Uh, you don't cut down the trees. They say they put bike paths along every road. Uh, and they have the, the oldest wildlife refuge in the United States called the J.M. Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge. And it's the, probably the best spot to see subtropical birds in the United States. It has huge flamingo flocks, for example. Um, and all kinds of other spoon build uh, storks, all kinds of things. But they said, they created a plan that said, well, how many people can we safely evacuate in case of a hurricane? How many people can we accommodate before we, we ruin the water supply, which is the key to the wildlife refuge? Uh, you know, it's asking questions like that, that will help set the, the, the limit on how much is too much. So there's a lot of things going on. There's, there's a lot written on this and, the, and the, the World Monuments Fund, for example, is right now in the middle of working with communities all over the world on the issue of over tourism and how to reduce it. Very good, thank you, Ed. Um, we had a question come in here via um, Heather's phone. Um, I don't know whether anybody else might be having issues adding to the chat. If you do, then just please put your hand up and I will, I will get you um, in that way. Um, but the, the question that was, uh, that was sent through to Heather is, 
Um, do you feel that it's best to develop opportunities on a small regional scale or on a larger geographical scale? Um, so, for example, you know, is it better to do a Fermanagh type, you know, um, development of, of opportunities, which is which is our county scale, or is it better to really focus on a all Northern Ireland scale? Well, hard to answer that without knowing more about the, the specific geography. I think that, you know, in some cases, it, regional scale works best. In other cases, it's, it's a larger scale. But I, I think that, you know, everything starts by look, inventorying your own assets, being very clear about what those assets are, how they could be enhanced, or what new assets could be created, for example. I mean, one, one of the things that, you know, I think a lot of people who go to Northern Ireland, they, they start off in Belfast and then they take the Northern coast and they don't go down into the rest of the country. So thinking about how to get some of those people to extend their vacations uh, down into, you know, Southwest Northern Ireland would it is a way you might work with the national uh, folks to, to help people think about that. Cause you're so, you, you know, you've got something very unique in the part of the country you live in uh, and it's not well known. I think it is a it is a well kept secret in a, in, a, in a way. And and so, the more you do to make yourself known to visitors and others, uh, and to the people who are in charge of tourism would help. But I think it's a combination of both. And I don't really know all the assets and able to answer that really very intelligently. That's that's great. Thank you, Ed. I wonder at this point, Sheena, whether I could bring you in. From a tourism Northern Ireland point of view, and maybe just just share some of your um, ideas around the the wider NI tourism um, strategy, and also potentially some of your thoughts on managing over tourism in 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 specific places. <coughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to uh, send my apologies now because I'm barking here today. So um, if I'm coughing down the line, I apologise. And also my line's not too good, so I've, I've kept my video off, so I hope you don't mind. Um, in terms of um, a few different things that we've tried in Northern Ireland, or things that we're trying in Northern Ireland to manage that over tourism, if I take that question first. Well, there's one really good example of a project that we're trying to run um, in Fermanagh, actually. And it's around Devonish Island. And I know, Ed, you'd used an example there of Devonish there in your presentation. But, you know, um, we were trying to figure out how we would... Um, responsibly develop the island and responsibly develop ex visitor experiences on the island. And I kept using the analogy whenever I was talking to the group, it was a group of um, public sector agencies, so ourselves, uh, the council and Waterways Ireland and a uh, historical environment division got together to see what we could do here. <clears throat> and I kept using the uh, analogy of we don't want to turn Devonish into Disneyland because we very much wanted to make sure that any development was fitted with the ethos of the island itself, but also that it was responsible and sustainable in terms of, of what it was that we were trying to achieve in the island. It's only a small wee place, so how did we make sure that it was um, developed uh, to the best of our ability? And what we actually did was we, or what we're doing, is we are creating experiences that are running at alternative times. So we know that the, the island, and I know Ed sort of referred to this, but the island is busy at certain times, which is around sort of your, your peak times during the day. So instead of organising experiences, would add to the islands um, the dusk and dawn experience, which fit both with the nature of what was there on the island before. So of course the um, monastic uh, heritage of the island, they're up at the crack of dawn. So now we've got a dawn yoga session um, on the island and we've also got a dusk experience too. So it's, it's little things like that and, and using um, the assets that you have to the best of your ability um, while also being very cognizant of how the how the island or or, or what the falls already on the island and how the island cost. And um, all good examples of sort of that um, ticketing, even for different uh, visitor attractions, including um, the Giants Causeway and Carca Reed, and how they have introduced time ticketing or um, different prices for ticketing if it is a paid for uh, experience, and that's helped to disperse the crowds as well. Um, the Morans obviously is another comparator to the Fermanagh area as it's very um, rural in its in its outlook and very rural in its offer. And they have um, 
they have introduced wardens that are there to uh, direct traffic because we've got traffic, we've got real issues with traffic and people parking on the sides of the roads and farmers getting annoyed and local people getting annoyed because they can't get their kids to school and what whatnot. And now they've introduced wardens and it's that sort of joint and I think it's the Morn Heritage Trust and I think there's somebody maybe on the call here from the Morn Heritage Trust. So if you want to jump in, feel free to do so. But they, they've um, worked with the Morn Heritage Trust to introduce people on the ground to actually try and manage some of their honeypot areas. Areas. And I do think it's had quite a significant um, impact, both from relationships of those local people who, you know, really allow others to use their beautiful area that they, they live in day to day, but also uh, the impact on the environment around some of those car parks and areas. Um, so, yeah, I think that that answers your question on sort of Northern Ireland a, a examples. But was there another question that I've forgotten to answer there, Elmarie? Um, she had, I think it was around, um, is it best to develop opportunities on a small regional scale? So is it best to kind of focus on the Fermanagh area here or should we really focus of, you know, in, in linking into the, to the, to the wider NI um, national strategy? Okay, there's a bit of both there. You know, I think that for, for the um, Fermanagh destination is something that they could really harness. And there has been research done um, to show that Fermanagh has that um, serene, I think it was island tranquility was the word that was used around the there in waterways. And it was that that was the real attractor. And it wasn't the fact that there was going to be massive crowds there. It was that you went there to get away and you went there to find a sense of peace. And I feel like anything that is done in Fermanagh needs to really speak to that sort of essence of what Fermanagh and the, and the Lake area especially is trying to achieve. But in terms of the, the overall destination uh, for the, the um, Northern Ireland destination and the Northern Ireland cell, it's something that strategically we're trying to look at in-house. In fact, this is very timely. We just had a, a full Northern Ireland Tourist Board staff day all dedicated to sustainability last week because we're very aware that it's not just a trend, it's something that we all have to be um, aware of and responding to um, within all of our units and all of our remits. And I think that we'll start to see some tr changes rolling out and some actions rolling out from that in the near future. So it's something that we're, we're all looking at. And I would very much encourage anybody who's trying to do anything in this space to crack on because any sort of um, progress in it is good progress and I think that we're all we're all trying um, different things so including ourselves we're all learning we're all trying and, and Ed made some really good examples there and what was actually really refreshing from your presentation Ed as well was that some of these examples that you've given well a lot of them or some of them at least you can see examples of that across Northern Ireland and I know that you use some and especially you can see some examples of that across the Fermanagh region too of things that have been done since the year dot and we're doing it without even trying or without without communicating it or without being aware that we are actually um, we we're actually working in a sustainable way. And I think part of it is that we need to be shouting loud, louder about what it is that we're currently doing as well and recognising what we're currently doing. And I know that we're it's a piece that we're very aware of in house, but it's something that Fermanagh could be looking at as well as a region too, as part of their USP to get people to the Fermanagh region. That's great. Thank you, Sheena. Um, I just had a question come in here to me um, as well. Um, Ed, from your learnings from the work of Mainstream America, um, in a community like ours, where would you start to encourage and create a, a shared understanding of this community uniqueness? Um, and who do you involve in that conversation? Is it a very formal process that, you know, a stakeholder leads and engages the community to kind of, you know, develop that sense of place or is it something that organically develops over time? Well through the Main Street program we have a, a, a really uh, a pretty formal process that involves um, you know design, organization, um, economic vitality uh, and uh, fundraising and events things like that so uh, it, in America, we have, oh, I guess, almost 22,000 incorporated communities. And over the last couple of decades, two thirds of the small communities in the United States have lost population. Um, 
people moving to big cities, this sort of thing, uh, thinking there's no future there. A, th a third have gained population and they always have a few things in common. Um, you know, sometimes it's just the accident of geography. They're in the orbit of a big city. They have a college or university, that sort of thing. But, you know, the communities that are growing in America are ones that young people may leave after, you know, to go to college. But then when it comes time to, you know, to have a family and go to work, they may decide that's a good place to go back to because it's a good place to live. And that's what I was trying to make the point about the sort of quality of life things. Uh, that the more you do to invest in the quality of the place you live, the more likely you are to be competitive, not just in tourism, but in, 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 the, in a global economy where people are literally foot loose and can live anywhere. The, the more distinctive investment in places you are. Let me just give an example of what I mean by investment in place. So my daughter lives in a small city about an hour north of Washington, D.C. called Frederick, Maryland. And... Uh, Frederick has a beautiful downtown with, you know, incredible historic buildings, uh, but it was pretty much uh, in, I wouldn't say abandoned, but really uh, under, you know, disinvested and, not, you know, not much going on there. They had a constant flooding problem. They have a small river that goes through downtown called Carroll Creek. And back in the flood, the flood down, uh, you know, they called in the U.S. Corps of Engineers to talk about building levees and, you know, stormwater diversion, this sort of things. But the then mayor of uh, Frederick, Maryland, said, you know, why don't we use this, uh, use adversity to create opportunity? And he said, when we build back, we should build back better. So what he proposed was to build a small town version of the San Antonio Riverwalk through Carroll, through downtown Frederick, Maryland. And instead of just putting the water, the storm water in a huge culvert, which was the original plan, he decided to create a, uh, a river walk on top of it with beautiful uh, walkways and so forth. And it cost $11 million more than the original Corps of Engineer plan. And there were lots of people who said, you know, oh, this costs too much money. You shouldn't do this, et cetera, et cetera. But this was leadership and he, so we're going to do it. And what happened was this created an incredible uh, asset in downtown, at having a river walk all along with it has fountains on it and public art and all this kind of stuff. And literally within the next decade, there was over $300 million of new investment directly on that river walk. And Frederick, Maryland today is the fastest growing small town in the state of Maryland. It has 5,000 people living in downtown. It has 800 stores, 200 retailers, at restaurants and retailers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it all began with an investment in themselves. Uh, another example is a small town in Idaho I went to recently. Uh, same thing, a disinvested downtown. Uh, they had this huge vacant parking lot behind Main Street, and they decided to take out the parking lot and put in a park that has an ice rink in the winter and it has fountains and uh, splash pads in the summer and has outdoor seating and it has a performance stage, et cetera. Cost $7.5 million. Uh, last year, they received 200,000 visitors uh, just to that plaza. They saw 12 new businesses open. Downtown vacancy shrank by 50%. Uh, and that's what I call investment in yourself, investment in, in, in place. And, you know, it's things like that, but, but starts off by looking at what you've already got. So in the case of Frederick, it was a small river, a small stream. Uh, in another place, it might be a vacant park. It could be something, anything, uh, but building on what makes you unique and, and, and building on that asset is really critical. I want to mention one other thing in terms of tourism management. A great example of tourism management is Charleston, South Carolina. It's one of uh, America's most historic cities. It's, uh, it's huge numbers of tourists go there, but what they, they have this area called South of Broad. And uh, Charleston's on a peninsula and the bottom of the peninsula is where most of the historic uh, town city is. And it used to be they'd have these big giant tour buses going into these residential neighborhoods to see all these beautiful old historic houses. And 
people would be getting off the buses and wandering into people's backyards and stuff. We talk about annoying the residents, this sort of thing. Well, um, Charleston adopted one of the first comprehensive tourism management plans in the United States. And the first thing they did is they took their visitor center and they took it out of the historic district. And they built their visitor center in a in an underinvested part of their city. And then they directed all of people coming there to, uh, to this visitor center, which was, which was not in the historic area. And then they, uh, they banned large tour buses south of Broad Street. Uh, they encouraged people to park their cars at the visitor center. They had small shuttle buses. They did things like uh, there was a big demand to build an aquarium in, in, uh, uh, in Charleston. So this, the mayor then said, well, we're not going to build it in the historic area because the historic area is already too crowded. So they built it in a part of town that nobody was going to. And it's that kind of thing where you, it, it's, it's like Gina was talking about, you know, uh, having programs at dawn and dusk or, or you know, f having events in the shoulder season. It's the same thing with, with spatial uh, th things as well. So you direct tourists to places that are underinvested uh, and you try to keep the, the numbers down in places that have been, been over visited, that sort of thing. And you, there are a lot of different ways to manage that, but to have a, have a plan for doing it is really the key th thing here. And so I'd encourage you, if you ever want to see a good tourism management plan, just go on the website of the city of Charleston and they've got a great example. That's fabulous. Thank you, Ed. Um, I have somebody with their hand up, but I can't see the name. I just see owner's iPhone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Can you, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, yes, yes. we can hear you. My name, is my name is Mary O'Driscoll and I actually am part of an initiative that was started in about 2016 by Tourism and I called uh, Cluster Groups. So I oh, am call, part call, call, call what, Mary? Say it again. We have formed a cluster, cluster group. Cluster so group. initially, yeah, along the, co the Causeway Coastal Route, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, or you're familiar yeah. with it, it's like our mini Wild Atlantic Way. And along that coast, um, we had four groups, four distinctive groups. So in the beginning, just when you left Belfast, was the Gobbins area, and then the Glens of Antrim, and then Causeway and Benevola. And in 2016, we all had our little groups, and we were working together in our little pockets. And then um, out of that came the idea that it would be a good idea if we had like an overall um, group that linked the whole thing so that if you were the visitor coming to Northern Ireland, you didn't know that there was Mid and East Antrim and Causeway Coast and Glens and whatever, because you don't need to know that. But you knew that this was a beautiful mini wild Atlantic way that actually is manageable. So by linking together, and we're still working on it, we've done a feasibility study which has just been submitted um, and for approval for the next stage of investment through investment, Invest in I. But the idea is like you were saying, uh, sustainable, working together, uh, wanting the tourists to stay longer. And we're very lucky in our corner of the woods up here in probably a lot of places in Northern Ireland, but in particular in the area that we are in, between the Glens and the Causeway, that Ballycastle is a traditional, old fashioned family town. We have the only inhabited um, island off the coast, which is Rathlin Island, which is still very beautiful and very important that it is preserved, like you say, in its sustainability. And I think that will happen because there's great interest, both with the, with the uh, population that live there and those of us that work there. We see that that's the gem in the crown. And the whole idea really is, um, I, like Sheena said earlier, I understand that, you know, you have to work in your own little pockets. But actually, Northern Ireland is so small and manageable that all the other areas could feed into the Causeway Coastal Route because they're just little how to say, diversions off it at the end of the day. So, you know, we have a huge potential up here to have something really sustainable. And we're at the right time now, you know, where we know that our unique selling point is the fact that it's small, sustainable, and we want quality, not quantity anymore. And, and I just was thinking as you were talking there, I think COVID in a weird way has shown us that actually we're better off with small numbers and quality than being overrun and, and right. quantity 
Um, so I, and I personally, in my own uh, private business that I am operating at the moment, is a little guest house. And last year we opened after being closed for two years. And what we did was we um, took smaller amounts of people. We gave them a really good experience. We didn't have everybody running in and out across them as they were sitting, enjoying themselves. And I don't think I changed very much from that. So I definitely see your point. We are far better off and we're all less st stressed in the business if it's quantity or quality and not quantity because it's very easy to give a good experience to a small group of people but if you've got hundreds of people screaming at you for coffee everybody gets fraught so um, i love really enjoyed your presentation i'm looking forward to seeing the pdf and i'll be sharing it with my group and thank you very much thank you very much you know thank you know it reminds much. me of the, the the old expression in this world of sustainable development you know the, the expression is think global act local I would say in tourism, you know, we think regional act local. So uh, Mary's example there, I think is a great one. Each of the places could do certain things, but to connect them all together in a way also makes sense. Uh, so thank you again for sharing that. Uh, thank you, Ed and Mary there. Um, Sheena, I see that, you, that your hand is up. I know that, that uh, TNI is doing some work around cluster groups. Do you may, um, is that maybe what you want to come back in for? Well, uh, no, it wasn't this time actually. Um, but yes, we're doing plenty of work. We've got cluster clusteritis. There's cluster coming out of our ears at the minute. They're everywhere, um, which is great to see because these local clusters are really coming up with interesting solutions for their local areas and connecting the dots of the local areas that we can't do on a regional on a regional uh, scale. And just I just wanted to echo sort of what Mary had said there because she's completely right. We're already septics. And on today, I know you're not experiencing this, but six wet wee counties, and we are very small in the grand scheme of, of tourism. And but, however, we pack a huge punch, and it's very interesting that um, the tour operators that we work with at the minute, and the um, the business industry that we work with at the minute, are very much finding that outdoor. Well, not just outdoor, but um, Green and sustainable focused experiences are sort of high, just to echo again what Ed said there, on a lot of people's agendas. Now, as I said there, we, we're we doing a lot of this sort of, um, all, we're already, you know, um, competing in a way, but we aren't sharing what it is that we're actually doing. But we do have demand there from from the sort of buyers who are coming to and want to go to Northern Ireland. There's a general assumption that Ireland is green and it is because Ireland is associated with the colour green of course we if you look at our country we are green but we also need to make sure that we are standing over any green products and experiences um, or anything else that we're saying that is sustainable or green and that we're making sure that it fits the principles of, of uh, there's a lot of words to be used for green whether it be green sustainable regenerative that sort of circular economy thing but we need to make sure that that we are living by the principles of it and that we are not um, greenwashing as well, that we're making sure that that if we are saying that we are um, doing a certain thing, then we are living by that. So I would definitely say that if if you do have an experience or if your cluster are working on an experience or if you are um, a hotel or a guest house or anything else or a, a, a attraction and you are sort of working in that area, if you could get in touch with us, we're, we're looking for more examples. We're looking for case studies. We're looking for people to work with in this area. So um, if, if if you do think that you're at that stage or you're looking to get more into that sphere, I would definitely say get in touch with us and we can we can help and work work together in this year. Because as I said, we're all sort of learning. It's new territory for us all, even though we're doing it in some form of way. Um, but we, we do need more. We are, our, our um, buyers are asking for more. And if it's something that Fermanagh could harness in that area, then fantastic. That's me, Amory. That's great. Thank you, Sheena. Um, there's a couple of comments here as well. Um, uh, we were talking earlier about the wardens, Sheena, and you were mentioning the wardens in Mourns. Um, and David has just said that they called engage, engagement rangers. And their function is to engage, explain, encourage and educate visitors to the morn. So that certainly sounds like a um, 
like a fabulous program to to engage to engage local people um, in the process. Um, I also just want to bring in Tanya Kathkar here from, from Manor Lakeland Tourism, just to talk to us a little bit about the importance of creating unique experiences, you know, for this, um, for Manor Lakeland region. Hello, Elmarie, thank you very much. And thank you, Ed, that was a wonderful presentation. And um, I think as some of the other um, contributors said, it was good to see that there were little snippets of things that we could recognize that were being done in Northern Ireland and in the, the, the Fermanagh Lakelands. And as I say, I suppose they, where I would like to come in is the whole sort of, and you put it up at one of your first slides, sort of understanding sort of mass, the mass market tourism and sustainable tourism. And I think this is something that has even come even more to the fore since we have come out of the pandemic. I think, you know, ironically, there's some places in Fermanagh has probably had their best ever tourism visitor numbers in the last couple of years. And that's because people wanted to come to an area with wide open spaces that, you know, had a wonderful environment, that had wonderful landscapes. And that was something that came nearly post pandemic because that's what people wanted to discover places that were new, a much rural, you know, a more rural rather than an urban landscape. And, you know, as a result of the pandemic and the fact that people weren't traveling internationally, it ironically brought us a huge new audience of visitors, especially those from the Republic of Ireland, which again was what is one of our closest to home markets, but was probably a market that really wasn't coming to the Fermanagh Lakelands than, than, than we would have thought should come. And ironically as well, I would concur with what Sheena is saying with regard to tour operators. We did a lot of virtual workshops with overseas tour operators during the pandemic. And it actually gave those operators an opportunity to see what else is out there in Ireland? Where can I find the authentic Ireland? Where can I find a unique experience you know, a more distinctive and historic destination. And a lot of the presentations that we were doing to them, it was really starting to resonate that with our unique landscape, with our boardwalk, with our lakelands, with our geopark, with, and you mentioned, Ed, the importance of food tourism. We've got our own, um, you know, Enniskill and Taste experience now. We've got our own gin distillery. We have a lot of experiences that are being developed that's bringing together the tourist interacting with the local and experiencing something really authentic. And that really, you know, is important to us. And it's important for us from a marketing perspective to really find out what is distinctive and unique about the Fermanagh Lakelands area and how can we harness those experiences and get the message out there that we are a wonderful place to come and visit because we don't want to be a mass tu you know, des tourism destination. You know, we want to you know, engage with people that want to come and enjoy a natural environment, but have plenty to do. And we want to recognize that we have to look after that environment and you know, make it a place that people want to come and visit for years to, to come. So, um, it was just really interesting hearing all of that. And as I say, it's really exciting to see all of the experiences that are being developed in this region now from the food experience, from the island tranquility experience coming to Devonish, the whole slow tourism, the whole importance of you know, geopark development as well and what that can bring um, to the visitors. So it's a really exciting time. And again, as Sheena would say, you know, we're the marketing organization. If you have something that you're trying and you want a bit more of an audience, please come and talk to us and let us know um, what you have, because we're always looking for new stories to tell uh, via social media and our other promotional platforms. And, um, you know, as I say, it's those authentic experiences that the visitor that we're engaging with wants to hear about. So um, it's really exciting times trying to come out of this pandemic. And I think there 
hopefully should be really good things ahead for this uh, destination. Brilliant. Thank That's you very much, Tanya. Thank you, Tanya. No, thank you so much. You know, I can I can certainly agree with the with the amount of just new you know um, experiences coming coming after lockdown. So it's it's um, as you say a good time to be in for Manor. Um, we have um, Darren Rice from um, the, the Mongolian Frankfurt um, um, area. He sent us a link there for an excellent example of the development of intangible cultural heritage experiences, which is the Atlantic culture scape.eu. So we'll make sure that we send that link together with um, Ed's presentation at the, um, at the end of today. And then there's a very interesting comment also from um, one of our elected officials, um, Council uh, Siobhan Curry. And Siobhan, I wonder if you're still on the call, I wonder whether you might want to come in on that um, and just um, run through your message or if you're happy, I could, I could, I could read it out either. Yeah, no, I'm still here, Anne-Marie. Thanks so much. Thanks. Very good. Thanks. good to see you. You too. Thanks for organising today and um, thanks very much, Ed, too, for coming along. It was really, really, really interesting. And like Tanya was saying there, you know, so much that we can recognise in it, but also very thought provoking in, in things that we could maybe build on um, or do differently. And I was just struck when Sheena was talking and, and this kind of a question around do we focus on a smaller area, larger area? And, and just personally feel that we fit in very well in Fermanagh um, with the whole Ireland's hidden heartlands with that type of branding. Um, just as, you know, just that it's a, it's more of a feeling, I would say to that. Um, and then just very conscious that um, we are literally a stone's throw from the Wild Atlantic Way. And the area I represent is maybe four or five miles off it, you know, um, comes right in there, very close to Balik. Um, so I think, you know, there are two kind of big offerings there that we could could fit quite nicely into. And I know we've had those discussions before. Um, just, I think some of the things that Ed was saying there about creating the, the linkages, like we, I we do have like here in Enniskill and obviously we've got the castle, Maguire Castle and, and there's a bit of the, the history of the clan there. Um, and we talk about the definition, that monastic history and something we're hoping to develop more in the county. There's work going on around developing around the Annals of Ulster, which were of course just written just outside of Enniskill in here. That huge Gaelic culture, which isn't, as far as I can see, very well tied together um, or linked together. And I think it's a massive area um, of opportunity. Um, we have got um, the International Appalachian Trail now actually comes uh, through our district. So, and it's very closely linked to the Ulster American Folk Park, um, which is great. You know, it's, it's great and tells a big story of, of emigration and um, from this part of the world goes into Donegal as well. Um, but just, I think we're just missing a, a, a missing a massive part of it there, just linking together that um, Gaelic culture. And also, uh, as Ed was saying about some of the, some of the things we might like to forget, and obviously we've the more recent conflict here, um, and I know that that would be a big attractor, particularly around Belfast and Derry, um, but old, f further back than that, maybe, you know, the famine and the story um, and, and everything that goes with that. And I think actually for Mana, a little known fact is for Mana, I think, I think it was half the population or, or more than half of the population was lost during the famine. I think it was actually one of the counties that was hit hardest in Ireland and we hear very little about that but we do have a couple of famine graveyards so I suppose it's just uh, it was just to comment that uh, you know that maybe we could be doing a little bit more than that I'd also just be interested just when I'm sitting here looking out the window on a very stormy day here in Enniskillen um, if Ed's got any examples of how we how you uh, positively market the weather 
<laughs> that, can be, that can be a bit of a challenge, you know, and just when you're talking Ed, about, you know, if uh, this isn't what it looked like on the postcard, you know, type of thing, you know, it's it, we don't have an awful amount of sunny days here. That's why we have such a beautiful lakeland. Uh, we're just the perfect amount of rain away from the Atlantic or the perfect cloud away from the Atlantic. But I wonder if you've, I, I think about the Pacific Northwest there in the United States, you know, have you got any good examples of, of how you market a place for the weather? But thanks well, so much for <laughs> Well, you know, you know, it's funny that you say that because uh, I mentioned that I walked across uh, Ireland. I went from, uh, started on the uh, Irish Sea and County Wicklow and ended up at the end of the Barra Peninsula on Dursey Island. And um, there's, there's so much beautiful coastline in, in, in both the Republic and in Northern Ireland, some of the most beautiful coasts and beaches in the world. And if you had, if you had, the, if you had great weather, they, they would all look like Benetton, Spain. There would be high rise buildings everywhere and there would be you know, traffic jams and this sort of thing. So the weather is actually one of the things that saves you, I think. And the Pacific Northwest is a good example. I mean, they get lots of rain there also. And, but it's a beautiful place and it's become one of America's, you know, I think probably fastest growing destinations because it is different and it is unique. You just have, if you come well prepared for the rain, uh, you know, and you, and you know what to expect, I think it's, it, it doesn't take away from the experience at all. And, it, uh, and this whole idea that I think you've all talked about, this idea that, you know, you're from an authentic, hidden, unspoiled, quiet part of the, the world, there are so many people, particularly people with money, who are looking to get away from this mass development, mass tourism, mass marketing kind of thing. And you have something very special and unique there. So I think there's, you know, it's, you know, it's not necessarily a downside. It actually can be a plus in certain ways. It's, it's what I might, might call marketing jujitsu. It's you take what you think of as a negative and you turn it into a positive. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I think one of the things I just wanted to stress before we end here is that the importance of uh, of local government regulations, land use planning, urban design, things like that, because you know every place is changing and growing, and thinking about how you preserve what's unique does require public policy action as well, so that. You know, most people will be sensitive. Let me just give you, I'm going to end by just, I started off with a story today about my uh, getting sent to Germany during the Vietnam War. And I want to end with another story. I'm just going to turn on my, uh, show you this. So this is a, uh, I met a guy in uh, Heidelberg where I was, who's from a little town, the northernmost town in the state of Wisconsin. It's on Lake Superior. It's called Bayfield, Wisconsin. And um uh, it's been repeatedly voted the best small town in the Midwestern United States. And he took me out to uh, this field on the edge of town one day when I went to visit him and there was this kind of rock monument there. And we walked over to the monument and it said this, it said, this site was proposed for development in 1983 through joint efforts, this development was prevented. And I'm looking at this like, what in the world is this? And I'm sort of scratching my head until we walk around to the other side of it. And it says, this marker is dedicated to the ancestors of the Ojibwe nation who lie beneath this ground. And it spoke to me in a very loud way about the power of place, the power of place. You know, why is it that you think, why is it do you think that people feel a sense of loss, like losing a loved one or a friend when a grove of trees is cut down and the historic building demolished or a scenic view obliterated. It is not because we can't plant new trees or build new buildings. It's because I believe our sense of identity and well-being is tied in a very profound way to special buildings, places, and views. These are the places that are invested with rich symbolic importance that contributes to our identity in a way no less fundamental than religion or language or culture. In ancient Rome, for example, there was a maxim that used to go that cities should preserve the visible symbols of their identity to give citizens a sense of security in a changing world. 2,000 years later, anthropologist Margaret Mead said almost exactly the same thing when she declared that, you know, uh, people feel a sense of loss uh, 
in a world that's changing. So, you know, preserving what is unique is not only good for the economy of Northern Ireland, I would suggest to you it's also good for the psychology of Northern Ireland as well. And that those things have great value beyond the dollars and cents. And so the work you're doing is I think extremely important. And I would just thank you for everything you're doing to, to, to make your community a better place to live, work, and to visit. And I'd just like to thank El Marie for inviting me today and for uh, your patience and sticking through us. And I hope my accent has not been too hard to understand. Absolutely. Now, thank you so much, Ed. There is absolutely nothing wrong with your accent. I think poor from other people is still trying to get used to my South African accent three years down the line. So I think that we have just, you know, overcome all of all of the um, language issues. So I, I certainly really wouldn't worry about that. Um, Sheena, I see that your hand is up there. Did you, you, oh, you just well, it's definitely an accident. accident. I was just trying to do a little clap, uh, reaction. But just while I'm on, it is also just to echo um, the thanks both to yourself and um, I think somebody else there has thought, said it already in the chat, but it was very thought provoking. And also, I think, as I said before, very reassure, reassuring to see that some of the things that you're talking about are already starting to happen, or or that we can we can build upon what we've already got. Um, but yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Great. That's great. Um, thank you, Sheena. Um, so, um, folks, I think on that note, we will we will call it a day. I just really want to thank everybody for their time. I know two hours taking out, you know, in the middle of the week in the afternoon is a lot to ask, you know. But I'm I'm grateful for your time, and I hope that you will leave as as inspired today as what as what I certainly am. Um, huge amount of thanks to Ed. You know, your knowledge is just you know it just blows me away every time that I listen to you. You know, this is not the first time that I've sat through um, one of Ed's workshops and every time I learn something new. So thank you so much, um, Ed. We we genuinely um, appreciate your time. Um, just a quick thank you again to um, Tourism NI for, of course, sponsoring um, today's event and also just to Sheena and to Tanya who, um, who supported us with the question and answer sessions there. And lastly, but absolutely not least, I want to thank my colleague Heather Gott um, who always sits in the background, you know, setting up all of these events for us, managing um, to make sure that people get on, that the speakers speak, and that everything runs so um, smoothly. So Heather, thank you um, so much for that. 